from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for coming. Welcome. Uh, I'm Catalina Gomez. I'm from the Hispanic Division. Uh, and before we um, go ahead and begin with the program, I wanted to just uh, announce very little, uh, just a few things. Uh, this event is part of Hispanic Heritage Month. We're sort of in the middle of Hispanic Heritage Month. It began in, on September uh, 15th, and it ends in October 15th. Uh, it's been a wonderful um, series of events, and we still have about three to four wonderful programs. We have the calendar of events uh, outside, so please <coughs> feel free to grab uh, our calendar of, for, for the celebration. Uh, please turn off your cell phones or uh, silence uh, your devices, uh, and we're actually filming this event, so, um, so please, uh, we ask you to, to either turn off or silence your phones. Uh, and then one last thing, we, um, Wanted, I wanted to briefly mention the survey that we just passed out. This is a survey that the Office of Communications of the uh, Library is collecting, um, and it's f for us to serve our uh, patrons better with our events and programs. So thank you so much for filling that out. Uh, it really helps the library find out how you guys find out about our programs and um, you know, uh, just better our efforts with publicizing our, our events. So I'm going to pass this on to the Chief of the Hispanic Division, Georgette Dorn. So please uh, give a hand to Georgette Dorn. Thank you, Catalina, wonderful, wonderful organizer of this wonderful event. And I want to thank very much uh, Terry Sierra, who introduced me to Gonzalo Quintero. And when I met him, I said, perfect for Hispanic Heritage Month because Bernardo de Galvez is a great favorite of mine and a very, very important person. And of course here we mostly know Lafayette because he was flamboyant and he fought in the revolution, but nada que ver, you know, Gonzalo, eh, este, Bernardo de Galvez put the, the real thing. He helped greatly the American Revolution. Um, Gonzalo Quintero is fellow at the Weatherhead Center of International Affairs at Harvard University and visiting scholar at the Department of History in the Zanville Krieger School of Arts and Sciences at Johns Hopkins. He uh, has a PhD in, in uh, American <coughs> history from uh, the Complutense University. And in addition to being a scholar and a professor, he also was ambassador to Pakistan from Spain, ambassador of Pakistan, and also served at the, at the United Nations as, as permanent representative of Spain. Gonzalo. Thank you very much. Um, I wish to start by thanking the Library of Congress and especially its Hispanic Division for inviting me today. I am also in depth with the Hispanic Division since a great deal of my research for my last book on Bernardo de Galvez was possible thanks to the kind and extremely professional help provided by its staff. Thank you very much for that. Um, Every generation has the right, but also the duty, to rewrite its own country's history. History is written from the present, and if the present changes, so history must change. Thirty years ago, the history of the American Revolution was just the history of the founding fathers in the 13 original colonies. The founding mothers, of course, were completely forgotten. <laughs> but not only them. It was not till last decades that the role played in the American Revolution by African Americans and Native Americans has been studied and recognized. With these two important incorporations, the picture of the American Revolution or what happened in the North American continent in those years is broader but far from complete. For that, we need to go beyond what happened in the original 13 colonies. Because in, 19, in 1775, Britain had, depending how you count them, around 23 colonies in America. And only half of them rebelled against the British rule. What happened there had a direct impact on the American Revolution. And in those parts of the American continent, and also in the strategic and material support to the American Revolution, Spain played an important part 
that is normally not well known. The Revolutionary, the revolutionary War was a revolutionary war, but it was a global war. The Revolutionary War was just a part of a theater of operations of the war that took place at the time. Those three dots mark the three theater of operations that were involved in the war. The American theater, the European one, and the Asian theater. In the American one, actually there were several sub-theaters. The, the one you are most uh, familiarized with is the, uh, what happened uh, in the 13 American colonies. But it was not the only one. Main important battles were fought in the South, where the colonies remained loyal to the British, and thus the role of Bernardo de Galvez. He won the Battle of Pensacola, Mobile, Manchac, and Baton Rouge. But also in the Caribbean. Spain's main uh, objective in the Caribbean was to seize Jamaica from the British. Actually, Jamaica was the British's most cherished possession in the whole Americas. The threat of losing Jamaica was really the key for the ending of the war. When the Britons realized that they were about to lose Jamaica, they sued for peace for, to France and, for, and to Spain. Because of the fear of losing Jamaica, they were forced to make peace and to surrender the 13 original colonies. But then also there, there was a fourth subsidiary of operations in America. It was the Central America. The Britons made several attempts against several parts in Guatemala that were repelled by the governor of Guatemala at the time, who by chance, and not by chance, was Bernardo de Galvez's father. The second one was the European theater of operations. The first one was Minorca. Minorca was, is an island that was taken from the Spaniards by the Brits in the beginning of the 18th century. And Spain always wanted to have it back. And during this war, one of the main operations was the conquest of the island of Menorca. So the Brits had to uh, keep in Menorca a huge garrison in order to defend itself. Second, Gibraltar. Gibraltar was the biggest battle in the American Revolutionary War. It, Im it involved the most people and the most, uh, uh, um, uh, the most uh, ships than any other battle in the Revolutionary War. Uh, finally, the uh, Spaniards weren't unable to seize Gibraltar, and it continues so. And also, another episode that is not well known, the Spanish and the French were organizing an invasion of the British Islands. That meant that the British Navy had to patrol all the uh, seas and all the waters surrounding the British Isles in order to prevent the French and the Spaniards to, uh, for invading their homeland. In India, the French and the uh, Dutch possessions in, uh, in India were attacked, or they attacked British possessions, so that meant that the British had to be involved and also taking care of that uh, particular um, area. Now, Bernardo de Galvez and how he fits in all this global war. Bernardo de Galvez was born in a very poor family. Actually, there were shepherds in a small town and very poor town in the south of Spain called Macharabiaya. It's even difficult to pronounce it even for a Spaniard, okay? <laughs> so uh, they were actually four brothers his father, Bernardo's father, Matias, and three other brothers. The brightest one and the oldest one was Jose. Jose de Galvez actually was just a shepherd, and he went to the local school. When the local bishop paid a visit to the local school, he discovered the brilliant boy that Jose was. And he decided to give him a scholarship to become a priest to the seminary in Malaga. He wasn't interested in being a priest, but he was interested in living Macharabiaya. So he accepted the scholarship, he studied for several years, and then he convinced the priest that uh, he would serve better the church, becoming a lawyer. And he went to the University of Alcalá, he graduated with honors, he started an important uh, career in, uh, in, an o in, in, in a legal office, um, and uh, he uh, became known as the best lawyer in town. He got involved in politics, which is normal for lawyers, <laughs> and he was offered a posting. The most important posting at the time was the Minister of the Indies, that wins the Minister for the Colonies, you will call it. And under his command was not only the colonies, but also the Navy 
to protect the colonies. So the power um, uh, uh, be, be, um, in his hands was huge. He would be minister for the Indies for more than 15 years. And during his 15 years, he helped a little his family. He made uh, one of his uh, brothers uh, governor in, of Guatemala, and then viceroy of Mexico. Other of his brothers, he made him uh, ambassador to Berlin and to Catherine the Great. And the other of his brothers, he was so bad that he could only not, uh, appointed him as the guy dealing with taxes in the port of Cadiz. And he did a very good job there for himself because he um, uh, amassed a huge amount of money in not very um, uh, strict ways. But he was uh, not that way, José de Galvez. And he had no kids. And so his heir was his nephew, Bernardo. Bernardo had got uh, his opportunity. He entered not the, the career of arms, not in the Spanish army, but in the French one. Why? Because f if, in order to become a Spanish, uh, an officer in a Spanish regiment, you, have to, you need to have contacts. You need to be noble or at least of a family that is well known. The Galvez at the time were nobodies. But Jose de Galvez was just the lawyer of the French embassy in Madrid. So what he did is he used his French contacts and he got an appointment for his uh, nephew in the French army. And the French army at the time was allied with the Spanish army. They uh, were allies in a short war against Portugal in which an invasion took place. But actually, the regiment in which Bernardo was, uh, was a lieutenant actually saw no action. So but actually, the only thing he learned there is French, which would be very important for his future career. After his short period of being a lieutenant in the French army, he got, uh, through connections of his uncle, he got that his rank would be uh, recognized in the Spanish army. So he entered the Spanish army as a lieutenant. Uh, he spent several years doing almost nothing. There's no record about this, uh, th those two years. And then uh, his uncle was uh, appointed visitor general for New Spain. That's a, uh, an appointment of a general inspector, something like that. For you to know, New Spain, today's Mexico, but not only Mexico, actually, is from the, mi from the, um, uh, from the middle of the U.S. till Panama, that chunk of land. The Changalong was the richest viceroyalty in Spain. Uh, the Spanish Empire and the British Empire, we will go to that afterwards, were completely different. When the Britons or the French make an empire, they make sure that the most important city of their empire is either London or Paris, which is normal. Your metropolis is the most important city. But that, 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 uh, that thing did not happen, did not happen with the Spanish Empire. In the Spanish Empire, Madrid was not by far the largest city, nor the most rich one. The richest and the most populated city in the Spanish Empire was Mexico. Why? Because it was in the middle of the Atlantic uh, <coughs> commerce and the Pacific commerce. And the, the sheer size of Mexico City was double or triple the size of M Madrid. It depends on the, on, on the time you, you, you're taking into account. And it was the largest city in all, this, uh, in all the Spanish Empire. Larger than Seville, larger than Barcelona, larger than Valencia, larger than any city in the Iberian Peninsula. So, being appointed Visitor General for New Spain was a huge, important thing to be appointed. His powers were enormous. And when, he was, when, uh, when José was there uh, for a couple of years, he was able to, re to, claim, uh, to ask his, uh, his nephew to come and to and appoint him in the, in, in, uh, as captain in, the, uh, in one of the presidios. Um, he uh, went in 17... Uh, 69 to, uh, to Mexico, and he was in charge of a company fighting the Apache at the time. Uh, the wars uh, against the Apache were on and off during centuries. But actually, there was not such thing as a war against the Apache because the Apache were not a whole thing. What they were called the Apache were a succession of groups that actually had certain traits and cultural traits in common but they could be at war with each other, so they have no, no unity. So it was impossible to have a war against the Apache, because you can have a war against a, a, a tiny part of the Mescalero, while at the same time you were, you were in peace with a tiny part of the Jicarilla, and that depends. There are 17 groups of the Apache at the same time. 
The thing was that the situation in the northern frontier of New, of New Spain, which was at the time what is called today Texas, you know, was very unstable. They, and the settlers there were asking for a, a military campaign to be raised against the Native Americans. And Bernardo was the one who was in charge of commanding most of the troops that were, that were there. But instead of succumbing to this, war, to this warmongering uh, environment, he decided to study the Apache. Of course, the, object, the, the, the aim to study them, for studying them, was to defeat them. He was a military guy. But he studied not only their culture and their ways of war, but also the reasons for the war. And he concluded that the reasons for the war for the Apaches was the affronts they had to receive from the Spaniards. He also concluded that they often are accused of being cruel. But he demanded from the Spaniards that what they would think uh, 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 about us because we have been uh, being as cruel as they uh, we pretend that they are. So he he wrote a very balanced uh, report, a report that was not published at the time and was lost for uh, 200 years, and that was finally found in seven in, in 1814 in a, Sp in, a in a Mexican library, and uh, since it was not going to be published and it was not going to be public, he can. Uh, put there whatever he really thought was the truth. And the way he, uh, he, uh, he expresses himself, it's always wonderful. Then, after a series of, uh, of campaigns against the Apache, in, in which he was wounded uh, several times by arrows, lances, and stones thrown against him by the Apache, he returned to Spain and he was appointed to the uh, Avila Military, Military Academy which was the elite uh, institution created by Alexander O'Reilly, who was a Spaniard, one of the wild geese that uh, served in the Spanish uh, army for uh, 200 years. And um, this was the school that was going to prepare the future generals and lieutenant generals for the Spanish army. He was admitted there where he was only a captain, and he spent there a year and a half. But he was uh, not actually an intellectual, so he, he was not uh, happy going to class and everything. So when a war uh, broke up with uh, Algiers, uh, he presented himself as volunteer. The war was because of international politics. It was just uh, a way of showing the strength of the Sp new, new Spanish Navy to the other European powers. And which uh, better uh, objective than a tiny spot in the South Mediterranean that could be bombarded and, uh, and, uh, and invaded and taken uh, easily. Well, the thing was so ill-prepared and so ill-conceived and so ill-put into practice, there was a disaster. But uh, Bernardo had a chance to uh, distinguish himself during the, uh, the attack by not retreating from the beach, despite several direct orders he received, until the last of his, man, of his men was safely on board. So he was decorated after that, and he was promoted to lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel at the time, you need to be 45, 50 years at the time. He was only 30-something. And that, that happened all the time. And of course, envy started to play its role. But he was the nephew of the minister of Indies. So in order to, to, to be directly against Bernardo was difficult. For example, at this time, he was the nephew, and only the nephew, despite of this distinguished service of the Minister of Indies that when Alexander O'Reilly was thinking uh, of a candidate in order to promote him to being the colonel of the fixed regiment of infantry in Louisiana, uh, he thought about Bernardo and he wrote a letter to his uncle, not to him, explaining the reasons why he has chosen his uncle, because he knew French, he, has been, he had dealed, uh, dealt with the Indians, uh, Native, Native Americans in, the, in Mexico, so that experience will be very valuable in order to deal with the Native Americans living in Louisiana, so on and so forth. But he wrote to José de Galvez, not to Bernardo. So, well, who cares? Bernardo was very happy, and on June the 1st, uh, 1777, he landed in New Orleans and uh, as colonel of the Louisiana Fixed Regiment and as acting governor of Louisiana. Uh, the his instructions were two. First, to uh, be, uh, make Spain popular among the population. We must not forget that only 10 uh, years before, there had been a huge rebellion 
of the French original population of Louisiana against the new Spanish rulers. Sp uh, Louisiana was French uh, till 1763, and afterward it was switched to Spain, and it was not easy transition. And there was a rebellion, and Alexander O'Reilly, again the same Alexander O'Reilly, was the one who crushed the rebellion, but actually executing five, six people, that's not a, a huge cost at the time, and then everything was pacified. But it was pacified by the boot, by uh, the heavy hand. So Bernardo had the instructions to pacify and to make popular the Spanish, and the Spanish rule among the, the, the local population. The other part of his instructions was to uh, make sure that the Louisiana was ready when the war was going to, be to, uh, was going to break against Britain. We are talking about January 1777. And uh, of course, the Brits and the 13 colonies have been in war since uh, a couple, three years ago. So the Spaniards knew that uh, as long as this uh, war continued, it was good news for Spain, because it was bad news for Britain. <laughs> and in, in Spain, you have to take into account that we, the history of Spain can, t can be divided in two different periods. Either we're killing Frenchmen, or we are killing Englishmen. Okay? <laughs> At this particular time of our history, we were concentrating in killing British, okay? with the help of the French. But that would, that would, that would change uh, 25 years later, where we would be allies of the Brits killing the French in Napoleon. So it's either one or the other. So, but um, the importance of being a governor in Louisiana was, um, was beyond that. Uh, he entered into, he was idolized by the local population. He was very, he was, uh, he was a very fun, a fun guy to be with. He loved dancing, he loved uh, playing music, he, lo he played the guitar, he was uh, um, very popular, and uh, he was loved by the people. And he found love there. He found the daughter, uh, she was a widower, and she had one, a daughter, of a wealthy Louisiana merchant called Gilberto de San Marchand. She was Felicitas, and she was beautiful, and he completely f lost uh, his mind for her. Lost his mind because, actually, m it was a bad match, because when his uncle married, he married three times, each time with a wife of a better social position. The third one was the, s the daughter of the uh, Counts of La Puebla. The first one was nobody. So he was escalating social positions, and he, were, he was very concerned about that. And even though the saint Martian were the upper crust of Louisiana, come on, Louisiana was Louisiana, okay? <laughs> so uh, if, if he, who, he would have uh, been in love, fall, fell in love with the upper crust of Mexico City, well, maybe that would be different, but come on, Louisiana, <laughs> no? So he had a very hu a huge problem with his family, huge one, so huge that in order to, to um, to appease his uh, political family, and especially the wife of his uncle, he, n he baptized one of the new cities that he founded during his governorship in Louisiana as Valenzuela, whose was the name of, her un of, his, uncle's, uh, of his uncle's wife. Just to say, come on, I have put the name of her, and we are going to be friends again. The second thing is that uh, in order to marry uh, anyone, uh, uh, civil servant and an officer, in this case, need the permission of the king. It was in the, in the regulations, in the regulations. And there was no way he was going to uh, have the permission to, uh, to marry uh, Felice de Saint-Marchen. So he suddenly felt very ill, extremely ill. He was going to die. And there's a particular detail in, the, in canonic law, in canon law, that allows that when the marriage takes place in the, in the fear of death, the all the formalities can would be can be taken out, <laughs> and you can marry quickly without the all the all the proceedings and all the formalities. So he married that way, uh, Feliciana. I don't think he was so ill because eight <laughs> months and twenty five days after the marriage, Feliciana delivered a baby. <laughs> so either he recovered very very quickly or he was not that ill. The process, uh, in Spain, we invented bureaucracy, which is a good thing for a historian, because we have the, all the proceedings that ha what happened concerning his uh, authorization to get married. And it was great to see how everything, uh, at the end, was solved. 
Of course, but it was solved when he was governor of Louisiana, and he was a count, but not before. So he, 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 he became very creolized, uh, and he loved uh, America. Um, then, the, um, came the war against the Brits. Well, you see the chunk of land that was Spanish in 1777, uh, uh, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that the, the Spanish were interested in prolonging the war between the Brits and the 13 colonies as much as possible, because as long as the war was going on, the weaker the Brits were going. The Spanish were, the Spanish government at the time, after a thorough uh, debates in the government, were not very interested in having the U.S. as an independent country. Why? Because it was a bad precedent for the Spanish Empire. If you have an someone who can become independent, maybe that idea would uh, be a bad idea for the Spanish colonies. But uh, in any case, they decided that they had to balance the two sides of the war. Between 1775 and 1777, and even a little bit later, the situation for the Continental Army was terrible. No supplies, nothing at all. So they need, the Spanish government decided that in order to balance the odds of the war, in order to prolong the war, they needed to supply and to give help to the Continental Army of George Washington. And they did it through two main channels. The first one that was used was, were several Spanish companies that were dealing with fisheries in Terranova and they had contacts with Boston. That was Gardoqui and Sons uh, House of Trade in, uh, in, uh, in Bilbao. And Gardoqui was later rewarded as, the f to, as being the first Spanish ambassador to the US. And this was the first channel they used. When all this part of the eastern coast was lost to the revolution, the Spaniards had to open a second channel in order to supply all the things, mainly ammunition, weapons, uniforms, tents, and cash. Hmm? So this was the second route. And in this second route, as you see, the Mississippi was the key. So what Spain needed to do is to clear up the Mississippi from the British in order to be able to supply whatever they, uh, the Spanish wanted to do. And in that role, Bernardo de Galvez was the acting governor of Louisiana. So it was his main role. Not only that, also from Texas came lots of cattle that uh, was actually sent to the uh, supplies for the Continental Army. The war against the Brits. Before the news, the official news arrived, Bernardo knew that Spain had declared war to Britain. So in a preemptive attack, he sent his forces a very, uh, a, a very uh, diverse force, composed with 170 Spaniards from the peninsula, Spani European Spaniards. The rest were Frenchmen from the militias, mulatto, black from the free militias of New Orleans, and also 17 American volunteers. And with this small force, he attacked Manchac, Baton Rouge, and then he started the conquer of Mobile. Mobile was not that easy. He needed reinforcement from other places, but he succeeded in conquering Mobile. Uh, everyone was astonished that how this small force could deliver such a blow. Well, the blow was delivered mainly because it was unexpected. And uh, for example, against Mobile, when he was uh, sailing with his forces against Mobile, a huge hurricane stroke, and most of his ships uh, just sunk. And he was able to savage most of his people and some of the, of, of, the, of the arms and cannons and everything. And instead of retreating to New Orleans, which was the normal way or the, or the rational way to proceed, he continued the attack. And so the Brits were amazed that there were Spaniards over there because they, were, they, they have been told that their, their, their whole fleet has sunk in, in, a, in a storm two weeks before. But the, it wouldn't be the same in Pensacola. For Pensacola, he would need a very mo a bigger army. The thing was that Bernardo was a newcomer. And uh, the troops must come from Cuba. And in Cuba was the old generals of Havana that considered Bernardo just uh, a new guy with no connections, too, too, too much luck, and being a little temerary. So uh, they put every single problem they could. Not, 
directly because he was the nephew of the minister of Indies. But okay, you can delay, you can use uh, dilatory tactics, you can use red tape. And so I have made a calculation, 60% of the time Bernardo spent of his life, of his uh, active life, he had spent that time fighting bureaucracy. <laughs> Only 40% he was able to fight the British. Imagine what he could have done if he was relieved of these kind of problems. But that's the way things are. After conquering Pensacola, which was his finest hour, he returned to Spain for a year and a half, and uh, then he uh, was, uh, post was appointed governor of Cuba. But then he father his father died. His father was at the time viceroy of Mexico, and his uncle decided that he would be the successor of his father as viceroy of Mexico. That's a proof of the power of the Galvez family and Jose de Galvez. And he became, uh, he became uh, viceroy of Mexico. The most important posting that any Spaniard can have, can have during the 18th century, period. N compared only to the power of the king. Um, and there, he, did, he, he only governed for more, a little bit more than a year and a half. He died when he, there when he was 40 years old, 40 years old only. But uh, the most important thing he did in Mexico, besides starting several reforms, like the reform in the army or the reform in the northern provinces, was actually what his reaction to the uh, humanitarian crisis that started there, where all the uh, crops actually were burnt by, by a strange uh, natural phenomena, and the hunger was uh, rampant, rampant in, the, in the vice royalty. And what he did is defended the poor and the Native Americans and the Indians. When, when Spanish we talk about Indians, there's no value to it. It's just the way, the way they were called at the time. So he protected them from the abuses of the elite that was actually taking all the, all the, uh, all the food in their, gra in their granaries and in their, in, the, in their hands in order to raise uh, the, uh, the prices and uh, then uh, profit from, uh, from that thing. And he did a very good job uh, with the Bishop of Michoacan in order to prevent them and to be sure that uh, this was not possible to, uh, to feed the people. He also was very popular because he loved uh, attending parties, he loved attending uh, bullfightings, he loved uh, walking down the street, which was unprecedented for a viceroy. No one had been there before as a viceroy strolling by, uh, on the streets. So he lo he, they loved him. Actually, there's the black legend about Bernardo that he was uh, trying to become uh, king of Mexico, which actually is not true. First, because this legend was born in the 1816, something like that, so well after that. And second, come on, there was no, 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 no real substance for, for that thing, because in, in 1786, which, which was the date that Bernardo was, uh, uh, died, there was no independence movement in any part of, America, of Latin America. So this was America in 1763. As you see, the French uh, between the Spanish and the British possessions. But 10 years later, this was America in 1783. And uh, all the tip of uh, Florida was because of Bernardo. The objective of Spain, as you can see there, was closing the Caribbean and to make it 100% a Spanish lake. The problem was with the Hamas and Jamaica that were still in, 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 in British hands. So thus, th those were our two main objectives. First, to take this, which Bernardo did, and the second one was to take Jamaica in order to close the Caribbean for or, uh, any other uh, non-Spanish vessel. But one of the most important findings I I've, I've have done during my research is the, uh, the ones concerning Spanish and Bernardo's uh, policies towards Native Americans. First, um, that involved um, first the borderlands. The borderlands is a very it's a it's a topic that has been uh, studied in uh, by historians for only the last uh, fifteen years, I would say. Uh, previously, historians tend to concentrate in the center when everything when when it was believed that the real thing happened that the real. McCoy was happening. 
But now that we are tending to concentrate on borderlands because in borderlands, there's a, in the borderlands, there's a way you define yourself in the way you define the other. And there's a trial of your institutions in order to see how your institutions work with the institutions of the other. So there's a cultural confrontation in that thing. And uh, when we're talking about the borderlands in, 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 in North America, is this huge chunk of land. Actually, uh, to, the, to the south of this area that I, I have marked, actually, the population was more or less settled, and it was more or less populated, and was more or less controlled by the Spanish state. But all this area actually was loosely populated very loosely populated, that means very loosely controlled. And what they did is they, in, during the 18th century, we're talking about the 18th century, they developed two uh, very important institutions that are at the heart of very important cities today in, in the U.S., which are the Mission and the Presidio. Are the Mission, well, you know about the Mission, there's no, no, way, no, no need to explain that, but the Presidio, the Presidio was, if you see a John Ford movie and you see Fort Apache, that's a Presidio. <laughs> no? Actually, that's a presidio, okay? You can see the fort, and you can see the Indians living around, and you can see uh, several settlers settling around the fort in order to have protection. Actually, it was a copy. That system of forts was a copy of the presidio. That's it. Second one, the, the Apache experience of Bernardo. Well, there you have a picture uh, made in uh, 1775 of how were supposedly to look the Apaches. Of course, <laughs> no relation what the Apache looked like. They were not dressed like that, N nothing to do. But they needed Apaches in order to paint them for the uh, Mexican, uh, for the palace of the uh, Viceroy of Mexico at the time, because they needed a, a portrait of every single uh, group of, uh, that was living in, in Mexico. So they needed Apaches, well, that's the way they portrayed. But Bernardo didn't fail uh, for this uh, official portraiture or didn't fail for the warm organ uh, environment that was prevailing in the northern frontier of, 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 of New Spain. As we have discussed before, he tried to understand the Apache culture in order to understand the reasons why they were at war and how to solve them. And we will go to, to there, in a, there in a moment. There was also a British model and a Spanish model concerning the uh, Indian policy uh, at the time, what was called at the time the Indian policy. The British model was based on commerce, trade, and gifts mainly, and the Spanish model was just to incorporate every single population into the social system designed for the Americas, which are completely different models. And But not only that, there's a singularity that I have found during my research here that uh, I would, would like to share to you. Britons, Anglo-Saxons, when they are in contact with other people, I don't know why you guys, you love to dress like them. I don't know. It's an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon I haven't found elsewhere. So you have the portrait of Joe Romy. He was uh, half, uh, half, uh, he was, sorry, half Mohawk and half, uh, half British. But when he decided to have his portrait, he decided to have it like that. But not only if you're half and half, only if you're a sir in the British Army and you come to fight <laughs> in the British Army here in the, in, in, in the, in the North America, you have your portrait like that. <laughs> Actually, for, it's a cultural shock for us. For us, I mean Hispanics, okay? This is the portrait of uh, George Catlin. George Catlin was a very important painter of the West. Very important one. And when he was uh, offered by his colleague, William Fix, to make his portrait, he dressed like an Indian. OK? But not only that. When the Britons go to India, they dress like Maharajas. <laughs> Those guys sitting down there, the, this guy is a British officer. OK? Lord Byron. When he went to Albania to fight for the Greek independence, he had his portrait and he, wh how he dressed, like an Albanian. The, the exception is Pocahontas. Pocahontas, when she was taken uh, by John Smith to uh, Britain, he had, she had a portrait. Actually, it's a Dutch, the original. It's a Dutch engraving. This is the original one. And she was dressed like an European. But most of the times, when I found 
portraits of uh, Native Americans uh, dressed as uh, Europeans, they have this nasty connotation. It's a mockery, it's like he's crazy, or making fun of him. This is the, a, a very important by George Cat Catlin, which, who was the, the, the guy who was portrayed before. And this is a very interesting one because it's the portrait of this particular chief, Pigeon's head, Egghead, before going to Washington to the left for, for visit and after going to Washington. Okay? Now let's return to the Spanish uh, mentality. There I have been unable to find a single portrait during the three centuries that Spain was ruling the Americas of a Spaniard dressed as, as a Native American. I haven't found them. If it exists, I, will, I would appreciate very much if you can supply it for me. It would be very interesting. This, for example, this was an um, Aztec warrior that switched sides and fought with Cortés. And when he had his, paint, his portrait done, he was portrayed like a conqueror, like a Western conqueror. He's wearing an, uh, the armor of the 16th century uh, uh, Hidalgo. Not only that, in Ecuador, in the 16th century, these are former slaves that escaped slavery and went to the Emerald Islands in Ecuador. And, though, and, and while, then, while there, these former slaves became the chief tanks of the population there. They signed a treaty with the Spanish king, and when they were offered to have a portrait done, they dressed like this. There's no mockery here. No, no, no. It's just the way they are. Here, very, another example. This is Nusta Beatriz. Nusta is the name. She, uh, Nusta is the Inca name, the Quechua name for princess. She was the daughter of an Aztec emperor, and she was married to the nephew of Juan, uh, San Ignacio de Loyola. That's the reason why you have the two priests over there. Okay? And um, um, you see, th there's, th there are the, the families of the bride and the families of the groom. And there's no distinction or mockery or uh, they're at the same level. Of course, they're a little bit upper the ones to the, to the right side. But I think uh, actually that it's because they are supposed to be in Spain. OK? Because this was portrait was made in Mexico. OK? Sorry, in Peru. OK? So I think, I think that this was, they are closer here because they were there. And the portrait was supposed, the, the, the family of the, of the groom were supposed to be in Spain. I don't see a difference in, in level there, but, but, but I could be wrong. So you see the differences between the, 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 the Spanish culture, the assimilation with the Native American population? It's a completely different mindset. Another example I have found interesting, I have found uh, concerning the roles of the Native Americans in the war, in the Revolutionary War, is that they have been portrayed normally as useless, and when they actually take, uh, to, uh, took arms in, uh, for one of those sites, they were extremely cruel. Well, n neither the case. These are the, cash uh, as I told you before, it's great to have a great bureaucracy in Spain because we have lots of data. We have the, 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 the men wounded and killed in the Pensacola campaign day by day. We don't have that for the Britons, but for the Spanish we do. So we can follow what happened day by day. And we can follow the main, pro the main uh, events during the campaign. This, you see, are all the killings. No? You see the officers, uh, men killed, the wounded, etc., etc., etc. But in this moment, when the attack on the main bastion to, uh, of, of Pensacola started, actually, all those killings, all of them were made by Indians. Not a single one was made by the British army. <laughs> It was done by the British Army in command, one or two officers, and then were Indian troops. So all the killings, that means in this particular case, we, we should not take this peak out. Uh, we should take, in, uh, in order to, uh, to evaluate the, uh, the situation, this peak out because this was a huge explosion that took place in Pensacola. So actually, it's not a fight. Actually, it's an explosion. So if you take this out, actually 70% of the casualties 
suffered by the Spaniards in the, in the siege of Pensacola were caused by Indians, by Native Americans. But were they cruel? Actually, no, because the ratio that, uh, that is uh, normal between wounded and dead at the time are um, the ratio between those, uh, sorry, those dead uh, against those wounded in combat between European troop was 33% were killed and 60% wounded. While in the combats that we have registered here between Spanish troops and uh, Native Americans, either on, uh, commanded by British officers or not, only 25.4 uh, were killed and 74.6 wounded. That means less killed than in European, uh, among European fights. If they were cruel, there was supposed to be a, high ratio, a higher ratio of dead. No, it's not. So they were important, at least in the Pensacola campaign, the Native Americans. And second, they were not cruel as they were, uh, as they had been accused of being. And just uh, finishing now, a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, Bernardo de Galvez, I already told you that he l died when he was 40. And uh, when he was 40, uh, he had very uh, little time for himself. Just, uh, it was only a period of less than uh, um, a year and a month when he returned from Louisiana and uh, before being appointed governor of Cuba. And, uh, and those, at that time, he was just uh, being the, uh, expert, the Spanish expert in Indian policy and the Spanish expert in American affairs. And he was consulted by the government every single time there was a, uh, a subject related to those. Uh, so he was bored to death. And what he did at the time, uh, at the time the, the fashion was ballooning, hot air balloons. It was like the craziness that took uh, everyone during the 60s and the uh, travels uh, to outer space. Everyone was crazy about uh, astronauts and rockets and everything. The difference was that the science involved in hot air ballooning is easily grasped by a normal person at the time. What the, 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 the science involved in rocketing is actually impossible to get unless you are Werner von Braun. So Bernardo, as a military man, uh, discovered that this invention of the Montgolfier uh, brothers could have very important military applications if you can control the direction of the balloon. So he decided to uh, create a model in order to Ex uh, try to explain that the way it's going to be uh, for the Spanish uh, air power to direct uh, its balloons. And it, uh, but he would not only design it, but he also designed an experiment that took place on March the 1st, 1784, in the channel of the River Manzanares close to Madrid. So he tried all those things and more than that. He invited the president of the Royal uh, Society at the time. Joseph Banks, uh, to attend the, the demonstration, and the other important scientists, scientists at the time. And uh, we know that he did that, because that engraving and that report is published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of that time. It was not recorded in Spain, but it was only recorded in, in Britain, and no less than in the Royal Society. So he also was a man of the Enlightenment. Uh, and to finish now, I would like to skip this. And to um, just uh, thank you for, uh, for being so kind with me today. Thank you again, the Spanish Division of the Library of Congress. I'm so indebted to you. And uh, any question you have, I would be more than glad to answer if I have the answer. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit deaf, though. He, uh, he was wounded several times, so he had problems with that. But actually, the thing that killed him was malaria that he contracted in <laughs> uh, Louisiana. At the time, the swamps in Louisiana were pff, terrible. <coughs> yeah? Uh, Galveston and Texas, 
Yeah. No, actually, uh, it, when Bernardo uh, started a colonization policies, founding uh, lots, of, lots of places over there, he, he started uh, choosing and picking up uh, names. But Galveston was not picked up by him. It was picked by the local population that wanted to congregate themselves with the governor, who was all powerful governor. So they, wanted, they told him that they wanted to be uh, Galveston. He, at first, he, he rejected the idea. He said it was too much, <laughs> but uh, they insisted so much that uh, finally he agreed. And uh, yeah, it's because of him. It's because of him himself. But he named other other. Uh, he named three little villages, Felicianas, for his uh, wife, and also a very interesting one. She uh, he called it Barataria. Barataria is the island that was governed by Sancho Panza, the squire of Don Quixote. So. But in, in, in Spain, in Spanish literature, it represents, like for you in British literature, the utopia of Thomas More. Mm -hmm. It's the place when everything is possible because they have a good ruler and everything's going to be perfect. So Barataria is like the um, model of a society. So, and he chose exactly that name uh, for one of the, of, the, of the little villages. At the end, it was destroyed. But uh, there's no traces of that. That's New York area and, and, and others. Sure. And it's so great to hear the Spanish point of view about uh, the American Revolution. But I, obviously, I'm going to be speaking to Americans who say, yes, but what about Bernardo de Galavan? So what do I say? <laughs> <laughs> he was the supreme commander of the French and Spanish troops in the North American continent. If the Spanish troops had not been involved attacking Manchac, Natchez, Baton Rouge, Mobile, and Pensacola. The Brits would have been able to concentrate all their might, both uh, naval and uh, the army, against the Continental Army and crush the Continental Army. So they had to spread their forces. So uh, they had to spread their forces not only to the, in, in the southern uh, states of present-day U.S., but also in the Caribbean. So they weren't able to concentrate enough forces against George Washington. So he saved the revolution. Oh, no. The one who saved the revolution was George Washington. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not even Lafayette. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I heard Carlos Marichal talk about the amount of money that Spain spent. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true, isn't it? That the, the money spent was far more than, than, uh, by Spain than France. Uh, no. Uh, th there's a. Marichal is wrong? Uh, <laughs> Is the way how you, you, you yeah, ha, the, the way have you how you uh, how you count the money? Uh, there are two ways of doing it, and I have doing I have done it both ways in, in my in my research. The first way is to go to the documents of the of, of the time, especially the reports of our ambassador to France at the time, and our later our ambassador to Britain, and then an ambassador to uh, to the U.S. in order to what the the, the amounts that we're talking about. If we follow that kind of, of thing, the amount delivered by Spain, both directly or indirectly, uh, for the uh, American Revolution was 15% of the total that, Fra that France delivered. But that was not the case. The thing that you have to take into account is also the other costs that, you, that were involved. I have studied the cost, of the defense cost of the Spanish Empire five years before during the revolution and five years after. And you can see there's a peak, a huge peak that had to be paid. That's a cost that actually Spain actually was, uh, was, uh, was suffering at the time. And the cost is like six times the, the, the normal cost of the uh, defense of the empire because they have to raise an army, they have to build new, new ships and everything. Uh, if you take the, I, this second way of, of, of counting the money into account, there's, there's no, uh, we are, uh, we, well, sorry, the Spanish contribution is great, is bigger than the, uh, than the French one. But there's a huge difference. The debts that the French incurred during this war are at the origin of the, Fran of the French Revolution. Everything started because of that. They weren't able to pay those debts. They had to call the general states in order to have to raise more taxes. And because of that, the French Revolution started. Okay, in Spain it didn't happen. So why? Because 
while the Britons tried to implement the new reforms of the empire in the 18th century, and it cracked, and the, and the American Revolution started, in Spain it didn't happen. The Spaniards were able, at the time, were able to implement the, revo the reforms of the Bourbons, the Enlightenment reforms in America, without the revolution, and everything working perfectly. So by the end of the 18th century, there was no movement in, the, in, Latin Amer in what is today Latin America that, were, that was in favor of independence. There were several problems and several revolts, but that were common during the, uh, the, uh, and, and, uh, the Ancien Regime, both in the Iberian Peninsula and in the Americas and other parts of the Spanish Empire. So it's not because there was a sentiment of independence. I'm talking about till the end of the 18th, okay? Till the end of the 18th. There was no sentiment of independence. There were unrest, yeah, but uh, the unrest uh, don't qualify if they don't uh, have something uh, uh, of independence be, uh, behind it. I have, I have the, the, the numbers, but I don't have them with me today. What kind of a person was the number that was? Sorry? What kind of a person was the number He was uh, fun. Oh, uh, there are s so many anecdotes uh, about him. Uh, for example, one, he was one day just uh, having a walk in, uh, in Mexico City, um, and which was unusual for a viceroy to do, but he, he loved it. And uh, he suddenly heard that uh, a poor uh, Indian uh, woman was crying, and he asked her what happened. No, the, the priest is uh, denying the, uh, the, the mass for my late husband because we don't have any money. And uh, so he said, well, come with me. We're going to solve this. So he went into the church with a with with woman, and he asked the priest to come. I said, is it true that uh, you are not giving a mass because he has no money? <coughs> no, 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 no. I said, oh, it's not the money. Of course it's not the money. No, we don't have here the car, the, the car, uh, the church. Uh, the, the, Sorry? The choir. The choir, sorry. <laughs> the choir in order to sing uh, as it should be done. Uh, no problem, I can sing. You have a guitar? Yes, I have a guitar. So he said, you go on and I will do the, the, the choir. So he, sa he sat, on, uh, he, put, he was uh, on, on the right side of the, of the altar. He took the guitar and sang <laughs> the, the, the music for, the, for that. Of course, after doing that, he was crazily popular among, um, among his people. Yeah. He loved uh, dancing with his wife. He loved uh, going to bullfightings with his wife and kids, uh, throwing everything. Uh, w w w you know, we have in Spain this terrible thing that's called bullfighting. I know it's a terrible thing. I do apologize, but it's the way things are today. I hope we will improve in the near future, but the present situation is we still do have bullfightings. Okay? So in the, eight, uh, the, the, the tradition there is when you like very much what happened in the, in the arena, uh, you throw whatever you have, your hat or your uh, jacket or whatever, N not shoes, okay? <laughs> but you throw whatever you want. So uh, one of, uh, of the time, uh, of those times, Bernardo got so excited that actually his wife had to stop him because he was taking his jacket, his shirt and everything in order to show it there. So he was fun. He was really fun. Also, he liked to have in his, we don't have the inventory of his library, but we have, s uh, partial inventories of uh, books found in the, in the sale that took place of all the, his things after his death. And there were books that were in the uh, Forbidden Index by the Inquisition, which is good. <laughs> which is good. Sorry? Yes? What year did he become viceroy in Mexico? 1785. 1785. Yeah, 1786 he was dead, yes. There were, sorry? You mentioned the Apaches. Ah. Right? And there were a series of wars, skirmishes between them and the Spanish. Mm -hmm. uh, can you pinpoint in your research when that first Spanish occurred or this is this? Oh. <laughs> the thing is, actually, the, the Apaches entered in contact with the Spaniards very early in the second half of the 16th century. Uh, the reason why they entered uh, into contact with the Spaniards is because the Apaches were displaced from their original lands by the Comanches. Mm -hmm. okay? The Comanches uh, decided to go south and they pushed the Apaches south. And the Apaches pushed the guys who were before them. So what we, tend, uh, we must bear in mind that the, uh, 
the uh, location of all these, we don't call them tribes anymore, but the gr these groups, uh, the Apaches, for example, uh, it depends very much on the precise time you are, you are studying. If because during the 16th century, they were far north, and there were no more con no, no contacts with the Spanish settlements. But as, uh, as long as uh, they started moving south, they started creating problems from the, Spani from the Spanish settlers. So, and also, be very much aware, there are 17 groups of Apache at the time. The Jicarillas, the Mezcalero, uh, lots of them. And uh, each one is just as, uh, had uh, some cultural traits that they share in common, but they have subgroups that can be in, at war with each other, and at the same time, another group in, at peace with the Spanish settlers at the time, but another group at war with the Spanish. So that created a lot of problems for the Spanish to understand in Madrid, that how are you telling me that you have just concluded a peace with the Apaches, and now you are, have be, uh, are being attacked by the same Apaches? No, it's not the same Apaches. It's another one. So it's a problem. The thing is that in Borderlands, what happened in, in America, is it was a different situation than from the main core of the empires. In the main core of the empires, I mean in the Aztec and the Incas, you have a pyramid. You just chop off the, the, the upper part of the pyramid, you put the Spaniards on top of that, and they can control everything. And everything will remain. At the beginning, of course, things will be changed uh, 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 very profoundly during the 300 years that the Span of Spanish rule, of course. But at the beginning, it was easy. The problem was, in certain parts of, uh, of, of America, meaning, uh, what is today the, U the United States and northern Mexico, meaning what is today Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador, and meaning s the south of Chile and Argentina, there were not kinds of structures of empire. So there were just groups and groups and groups and groups and groups. And the way to deal with those groups was normally attacking every single group, beheading, the s the beheading in, 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 the s in, in the sense of uh, the system, replacing the head of this particular group and put the uh, Spaniard in control. But since there were hundreds of those groups, it was an endless situation of war. Okay? So it was very difficult. The same happened in Colombia at the time with the Catholic Catholic. The same happened with the, in, with, with the uh, Indian rebellions in Chile and Argentina during the 16th, 17th, 19th century. And the same happened with the Apaches, the Comanches, the Choctaw, the Chicago, whatever. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>